Okay, thanks, David. So this is really a little bit more focused on my research rather than my conservation officer role. Uh, and most of the research has done, been done before uh, I joined the Wild Trout Trust as a, as a staff member. Um, thank you, Andreas, for putting that line in there about science and facts before anecdote and opinion. I'm sure a lot of you in the room have got opinions and anecdotes on uh, this particular beast here, the signal crayfish. And I'd like to hear some of them later, but I'm going to try and present some of the facts this morning. And this is only a few of the facts, some of it from my lab and some of it from other authors. So just a quick recap, there's 550 species of crayfish in the world. Uh, many of those have been spread around by aquaculture and the aquarium trade. There's about seven or eight that are actually classified as invasive, i.e. that they get out into the wild and they cause environmental or, or economic damage. In the UK, we have seven non-natives versus one native crayfish species. The most we hear about is the signal here. Some of those crayfish carry uh, the plague, which is detrimental to our native. Um, most crayfish are omnivores, so they di directly interact with all trophic levels. They can be, some of them can be described as keystone species. That means their impact has a, is disproportionately large compared to the biomass that is occurring in any particular river. They can also be classified as an ecosystem engineer. I'm sure all of you have got anecdotes or opinions about them burrowing into uh, soft banks, for example, um, disturbing sediments on rivers, uh, riverbeds, and uh, altering their ecosystem around them by their very actions of, of moving around or burrowing or foraging. And they have a capability to change ecosystem functioning, how the river or lake, uh, depending on where they are, is um, actually behaving or, or you know, functioning. Um, of course, a lot of those key traits, characteristics, makes them fantastic invaders. You've got to have a grudging respect for the little buggers. I have. I would hate to admit it. I do admire them. So, Julian Reynolds, very famous uh, crayfish ecologist from uh, Trinity College Dublin, summarised in a sort of an overview paper back in 2011, the main sort of crayfish-fish interactions. <coughs> crayfish, they prey on the fish of eggs. You can see quite a lot of similarity here between crayfish and fish. Crayfish can prey on fish eggs. They can allegedly prey on juvenile fish uh, if they get the opportunity to catch them. They can compete for food and shelter. Um, so young, um, young of year salmonids, for example, that spend a lot of time in exactly the same sort of places that crayfish like to occupy under, under rocks. They can alter their habitat as their ecosystem engineers, as I've said, by burrowing, by creating a lot of loose uh, suspended sediment. They can affect the community resources and biodiversity. Fish can do that, of course, as well. Um, they certainly affect community resources and biodiversity, obviously compete for food and shelter. They can prey upon the juveniles and fish are gape limited predators. If it fits, it'll go in and it'll go down their throat and they'll use it as a food resource. Um, Obviously, they can inhibit it, the foraging behaviour of crayfish by their very presence. So, if you turn to the science, there's a, a mixed bag out there, I have to say. I'm a scientist, I'll hold my hand up. There's some pretty shoddy science out there. But there's some really, really good stuff as well. One of these in particular, this group of authors um, working in Sweden. They are dealing with signal crayfish as an invader, but their native is obviously a noble crayfish. These guys have done a lot of work on um, fish crayfish interactions. They did a really nice experiment back in 2003 that they published. And this is just presenting some of the gut content data from the crayfish. And you can clearly see that there is room for potential competition with trout, because you've got things like Simulidae, Coronvidae, Ephemeroptera, Trichoptera, uh, Plecoptera on there. They are cannibalistic. They will eat them, sir, each other. Um, clearly, there's a few items of food in there that are not going to overlap with your classic trout diet. So you'd think that there would be an obvious interaction with trout directly through diet. The results of their experiment say no. Actually, this is not very easy to digest, but basically this is trout. Um, the number of survivors in the experimental arenas versus controls, the, the wet weight, the dry weight, and the total length of the trout were they affected by the crayfish presence in low density or high density treatments? 
None of these p-values suggest there was any significant impact on the trout in this experiment. Ooh. A lot of things which get anglers talking, well, one of the aspects that get anglers talking is this idea of predation by crayfish on fish eggs, particularly salmon eggs and trout eggs, of course. And there is no doubt that they can get at them, but you need to do quite detailed experiments to be able to show this. Um, and this is a really nice group, um, paper from a group at Durham University, Martin Lucas's group, who have done some really nice sort of size distribution. So this is crayfish carapace length from six millimeters right up to 44 millimeters, some pretty large beasts that they had in there, versus the proportion of eggs uh, <coughs> recovered from the experimental arenas that were healthy. And you can see that 100% of the eggs were in perfectly good condition up until the, the crayfish got above about 16 millimeters in carapace length. And it's when they're absolutely huge crayfish that they can do the most damage. It's not particularly surprising. These, these, the bigger the crayfish they are, the more likely they are to be able to excavate the, the uh, reds, for example. What this suggests to me is, of course, that it is an interesting proposition to maintain trapping on sections of rivers with reds. Because if you can, trapping tends to bias towards the bigger individuals, and some, may pe some people may come back and say, well, you know, large individuals control the smaller individuals. But if you're removing those really large individuals, A, you're potentially stopping them from producing more small individuals, and you're also severely reducing the risk of the damage to the eggs on the reds. This shows a completely different story. This is by uh, a well-renowned group um, up at uh, Glasgow, so Colin Adams group. A PhD student called Zara Gladman did some work where she was looking at uh, experimental arenas again, burying fish eggs in boxes, in reds, trying to mimic exactly the same sort of conditions that you would get naturally. And uh, also putting in a, a sort of other potential food source that uh, crayfish might go for. And she actually found the number of arenas uh, containing excavations, so evidence that the crayfish were actually digging down into the sediments and trying to pull these eggs out. Well, actually, she could find no evidence of, um, and virtually no evidence in, in either of the egg trials, whereas if there was a, a nice sort of fish bait down there, then they would definitely go for it. So, contrasting information there. I'm, I'm not going to actually present it today, but there are other papers out there which uh, look, look beyond the egg survival into, you know, fry survival, or um, uh, when, the, when the fish first come out of the eggs. And, you know, that suggests from those experimental arenas that the survivorship of trout, once they get out of the egg, can be lower in, um, in these experiments where crayfish treatments are uh, put upon them. But I think, again, the, the sort of the bias of those experiments is that you're not actually representing the true habitat. Once the fish come out of the, the gravel, they would tend to move directly into good, shaggy, quality habitat. There's no refugia aspect to any of these potential experiments. So I think the sort of work that we do, that we promote in terms of um, providing good habitat uh, should be factored into new experiments on this sort of thing. This is yeah, next to jump. This is some work that I've done with Kevin Wood when he was my master's student a um, long time ago. We've just got it published, um, primarily because we've had uh, other priorities. This isn't work on trout. It's on work on chub. What we've done is, is taken the sort of signal that's encapsulated in, in scales from fish that were in invaded sections of rivers or non-invaded sections of rivers. I hope you can just about make it out. If I, if, you, if I talk you through this example, then young of year fish, not plus fish, in invaded sections actually have a lower growth rate compared to uninvaded sections of the river. And that pattern, as you can see, stands for all of those rivers. What is interesting to note is that when the fish get to about four plus, when they're fairly hefty fish for a chub, they've got a big gape, they can start preying upon crayfish, and actually, in the invaded rivers, they start growing faster. So there's clearly some aspect of reciprocal 
interaction there. At the young ages, they do worse. At the larger ages, they're doing better. This is Chubb work. Um, this is some more data from the same project from Kevin. He knows this better than I do, so it's interesting to have him in the audience. Uh, but here again, we're looking at fork length at age and or mass at age. And in both cases, and we've got more data than this, I just threw up a couple of figures from particular rivers. The, the, both of those um, measures, the fork length or the mass, is lower in the invaded sections of the river than in the uninvaded sections. And we've done some stable isotope analysis of a chemical fingerprinting type of tool to, to look at the diet of these particular fish. And you can see that for small chub in non-invaded versus invaded, or large chub in non-invaded versus invaded, um, crayfish contribute to the biomass of those particular fish where they're present, between 20 to 30, perhaps 40% <coughs> in some cases. So they're definitely getting picked off by um, both the small and the large chub. And this is another study that I've done recently with colleagues at Bournemouth and Pete Redding of the Barbell Society, who provided a bit of the funding of this. The main aim of this was actually to work out how much of a contribution that the pellets that barbel anglers tend to put, up, uh, put into rivers in vast quantities, um, uh, the contribution they make to barbel diet. Again, this is a sort of non-invaded river versus an invaded river. It's got the crayfish in there. And this is a, an isotopic map of a food web. Basically, just think about it as coordinates in space. So it's a map of the food web. The pellets have a, an extraordinary signature because they're mostly derived from marine products compared to the rest of the freshwater food web, so we can use it as a cool tracer. And most of the barbel, perhaps not surprisingly, are heavily influenced by the amount of pellet material that's put in by anglers. So about 50% of their biomass is derived from the pellets. <laughs> yeah. Any barbel anglers in the room? Yeah. Anybody want to admit to how much pellet you put in? But interestingly, where crayfish are in the river, Barbel are quite happy to prey on the crayfish. There's a sort of, and what's interesting to me is, because all I hear is anecdotes from barbel anglers, that the crayfish are nicking me bait. Well, the crayfish signal is nothing like the pellet signal. So not much of their biomass can be actually being derived from that, which is really interesting, I think. But where the crayfish are, those barbel are absolutely nailing them. A much higher percentage, something like 70% of the biomass in some of these rivers is derived from crayfish. So another e interesting aspect is this turbidity angle, the ecosystem engineering, crayfish burrowing around, uh, in, uh, lifting sediment up into the river. This is a study I did with a load of geographers. I do work with geographers occasionally. They're not, no, yeah, they are scientists. Some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done, we've done lab work uh, where we've, put crayfish, you know, we've got tanks, we've measured turbidity without crayfish, we've put crayfish in there, and we've measured, measured the turbidity. But more importantly, we've done field work as well, where we've put these turbidity sensors in the river at different levels, and monitored and, you know, controlled for background variation that you might get. And this is a snapshot of some of the data that we've published. At the near bed scenario, it's interesting that you get this peak of turbidity after sunset. And of course, most crayfish are nocturnal in their activities. So perhaps not surprisingly, we get uh, a, a marked increase in the turbidity in the dark. Interestingly, if you measure the turbidity mid-flow, then actually you can see that sort of turbidity accumulating from the, the peak. There's a bit of a lag phase, but it increases, but it maintains for the following day as well, and it'll gradually tail off and come back to the sort of control level beforehand. So even away from the bed of the river, they're actually altering the turbidity of the water clarity, which is, of course, pretty important for a predator that relies on its eyes to feed. And there's also some really insidious effects that you might not necessarily think about initially. So this is some work from one of my PhD students ongoing, who's still down in London, wasn't allowed to transfer with me to Lancaster because he works on all sorts of really nasty invasive species. So this is some uh, sort of large pond experiments where try we're trying to recreate the, um, 
habitat of uh, the lake littoral zone, which might be important for fish nurseries, for example, not necessarily trout. Here we're looking at suspended sediment, so the amount of turbidity in ponds without crayfish, ponds with a low density of crayfish, ponds with a high density of crayfish. And this is in spring when it's cold. It was about an average of four degrees for the duration of that experiment. And there's absolutely, there's a slight trend, but there's no statistical significant difference between these values. It's relatively low suspended sediment. It's too cold for the crayfish to move around. Get to the summer, we're now looking at a tiny contribution, which is pretty much on the same scale. Notice the scale now goes from 0 to 300, as opposed to 10 to 50. So in the control, exactly the same position as you were in the summer. But in the low concentration of uh, crayfish and high density of crayfish, you've got this really, really strong impact of turbidity. So that's, you know, that's visible. We can see that. We can see the, um, the, the turbidity in the water column. It's really easy to detect. But just think about some of the indirect, effect, the indirect effects that could be occurring. So now we've turned the median turbidity onto this axis. And in the spring, we've, we've got the uh, low, uh, no crayfish, low density of crayfish, high density of crayfish in colours still. But we're measuring that against dissolved oxygen. When there's no activity, no turbidity, there's no relationship in the dissolved oxygen. Makes sense. <coughs> when we go to the summer situation now, you can note that the... All the no, or no crayfish treatments are still up there. They've got the same um, amount of oxygen in the water. But in the high density treatment, you're getting hypoxic conditions. That means it's perilous to life in water, purely driven by the amount of sediment that's being raised into the water column. So, just a whistle-stop tour of potential interactions with fish. They're numerous and they're very complex. Trying to get a handle on that from a scientific perspective, that complexity means it's perhaps not surprising that there are quite a lot of experimental results out there that appear contradictory, but we can drill down through those and, and try and find what out what the problems are and make better experiments on the back of that. We can clearly show that reciprocal predation is evident, but as Kevin noted in that paper, there's no real long-term population studies. You need... 10 to, 10 to 20 years of data to get a good handle on this and well Kevin was only an MSc student for nine months with me and he did a wonderful job of that experiment but you know trying to get funding for 10 to 20 years or trying to find the data that will extend to that in exactly the same way as we've looked at trends this morning is difficult. There's some fairly hideous indirect effects that people should be aware of as well um, that could have potentially equally important impacts upon fish. And I would just leave this at the, at the very end here by saying we're extremely signal-centric in the UK. There are other species here that are much, much worse in my opinion. I could, go, I could talk about this all day. I'm clearly not going to. Uh, but there are worse species that are established in the UK already and we need to do something about them now before they get to the sort of signal population densities. Thank you very much. Just say, if anybody wants any of these papers, I can please contact me and I'll, I'll distribute them freely. Fantastic. Thank you, John. I think that was a, a really fascinating talk there.